So thank you very much for the for inviting me and for the opportunity to meet your students. I must apologize for a few things. Firstly, I'm quite often struggling with time management. So if it is already 80 minutes, uh, 80 or 90 minutes after the beginning and you're supposed to get that snack or some wine, definitely do let me know about that. Second issue, I actually realized I was not that much sure about the level at which I should prepare the lecture because we are already discussing some meeting last summer and then um, kind of, we returned to that not so long time ago. So 
It may happen that what I'll be talking about may be a bit misdirected. If so, please feel free to let me to move on and we'll see how that works. I also prepared a bit long, uh, lengthier presentation, which probably you will be uh, later provided with. And so hopefully at least some of you might have received an email with some early reading, which I have shared before. Maybe you have been discouraged by how many pages were included, but there is actually a lot being published about China and the US and the EU every day. So uh, that's a just very short selection of what, what you might be interested in. So maybe let me try to start the presentation and we'll see how that will work. I probably prepared a bit too much. Oh, great, thanks. So here's my name again. So please feel free to call me Willem. It's just Czech version of William, as most of you know. I work at, Czech, work at Charles University, but obviously any opinions, numbers expressed here are my own, so nobody can be held responsible for that. And I work mostly at the Institute of Economic Studies. So if you are interested in some of the methodology here, definitely feel free to stop by and we can discuss how we can try to apply that in your own work or in your own research. Now, what I prepared was is probably a little bit too much. So we'll see how much of that we'll be able to manage. Uh, I would like to not just show you some numbers because actually there's an awful lot of numbers. Most of you will be, including myself, you will be probably losing track of the numbers very soon after I will start showing all the data. So I was more interested in the methodologies of how getting uh, how these numbers can be generated and then in their implications. So let me start by uh, reviewing briefly what some of you might have had time to read in the reading from the last week. So as we all have noticed in our media, including Czech media, including uh, events happening in Europe and in other countries, China has been increasingly active in attempts to exercise its economic power and influence. I apologize for this, I didn't assume I would be doing it in this traditional way. So uh, if under Feng Xiaoping, the original saying was, well, let's wait, let's hide our strength, let's wait for the future. Uh, the current China can be uh, described as a country fully flexing its muscles, sometimes perhaps even exaggerating its economic power and its importance, both in the mind of Chinese leaders and in their public activities. So, what you are experiencing? Hide it so that it's not disturbing that much. So, we have been experiencing the famous wolf warriors diplomacy, where in many cases, countries which are entirely harmless to China in terms of their relatively small size and in terms of their relative uh, peacefulness, like Sweden, have been experiencing very direct and very blunt threats by uh, Chinese diplomats who are supposed to represent China in these countries. Uh, we have been experiencing direct use of sticks, so both neighboring countries like Vietnam, but also more distant countries like Norway or more recently Lithuania have experienced a number of problems, typically disguised, unofficially declared embargoes. Norway in 2015, after uh, their politicians were not distancing them, themselves too clearly from Chinese dissidents, uh, China imposed an artificial embargo on the imports of salmon and salmon meat from Norway. And more recently, Lithuania, and you have seen the WTO document, which is pretty much a complaint by the EU to the WTO about uh, Chinese methods, where suddenly what happened was that Lithuanian, Lithuanian exporters to China have been experiencing troubles during customs processing. When you enter the code of a, a Lithuanian entity into Chinese software, suddenly there was a problem. It has to be delayed, postponed. The consignment was rejected. The same was happening to payments and lots of other issues. Uh, plus, there were additional, how to put that, messages where typically uh, German, but also other European producers were given hints by their Chinese partners, well, either you will leave Lithuania or you will try to convince Lithuanian politicians to play the ball and be a bit more tolerant, or we will simply cause you troubles. So deal with that somehow. It was never declared as an official policy, so you cannot find an official document saying, well, this, this, and this Lithuanian product is not allowed to be imported to China, or this and this and this Chinese product is not allowed to be exported to Lithuania. 
but it's, uh, it was enforced, it was implemented, and definitely it had some effect on trade. And there were some carrots. So uh, we have all heard about uh, One Belt, One Road uh, and about loans provided to developing countries and then attempts to redesign or modify international environment, both by increasing Chinese presence in existing agencies. So uh, China has been very dramatically expanding the representation of Chinese interns, trainees, diplomats in the United Nations and related agencies, as well as in attempting to provide alternative architecture, like the I AIIB, which perhaps could be seen as a kind of nascent alternative World Bank. Other countries are obviously responding. So some of the countries of, uh, let's say, the developed market, democratic world have noticed this, not only these, obviously, and they have started uh, responding by attempts to either decouple under Trump administration, the US become quite explicit about that, even though they used wrong explanation and to a large extent also, at least initially, wrong approach and reached not really that positive results. I mean, that first trade agreement between the US and China. Uh, EU started discussing very strongly anti-coercion instruments, so how to defend itself against pressure of other countries. What is interesting, especially in this building, is that when the EU started discussing that, it was actually the case of the United States that was supposed to be uh, addressed by these instruments because many Western Europeans, especially in France and in Spain, were still uh, thinking about the cases when the United States by Helms Barton's Act and other interventions prevented European companies from the dubious pleasure of having some interesting business in Iran, Cuba, and other nice friendly states like that. So, in, what was interesting in these debates, for instance, in the ECFR discussions on anti-coercion instruments, was a very large difference or very extreme difference between Eastern Europeans who saw these instruments as something against Russia and China, and the Western Europeans would see them as something against the United States. And other countries, including Japan, were starting investment and incentive programs that are supposed to help their domestic producers to uh, reduce their dependence on the Chinese market. So this is what we know, this is where we are. And now let's try to evaluate what that actually means and what is new about that. One thing which I forgot to mention, being a very down here at the slide, obviously we are also seeing always kind of counter uh, tendency or response by the other side. So in one of the texts that you were reading, there was the discussion about the uh, dual circulation strategy. And in a few minutes, you will see some examples of data for showing to us that not only the West is trying to be less dependent on China because of worries about possible uh, weaponization of this dependence, but also China is getting relatively more closed and becoming less dependent on other countries. So this could be said, and then uh, because I quite like economic history, I could bore you here to uh, till you are fully asleep with the historical economic data, some of you perhaps already know. Um, at the same time, I could say, well, it's nothing new. So in fact, there have been multiple or many examples of uh, historical situations when countries were trying to exercise their economic power as a kind of complement to military power or as a predecessor to military conflicts. I didn't resist and I put here actually some older data. So uh, the Megarmian decree issued by Athens in some fifth century before, our, uh, before Christ, which obviously was right before the Peloponnese Wars. Then uh, during the Cold War, attempts to reduce exports of sensitive commodities to the Warsaw Pact countries by means of implementing restrictions within, within the coordinating committee. And then wide range of sanctions imposed by many countries mutually. So obviously there are the US sanctions on Cuba that I mentioned before. There are a bit less known to most of us also economic sanctions imposed already by the EU on China. Since 1989, uh, European producers are not supposed to export weapons to China. And of course, in many cases in the past, countries were trying to deal with such tensions. So they were trying to reduce such vulnerabilities 
or they were trying to reduce their exposure to foreign influences in general, just like current China. So I don't have to go that far. I can actually stay in China and mention what happened during the Ming dynasty. Or when I look at US data, a bit less known to us Europeans, United States behaved beautifully foolishly in the early 19th century. It was between 1807 and 1809. They tried to impose embargo on pretty much all trading partners with which they were trading. So we'll later use this as a kind of natural experiment to see how large can be welfare effects of such a step. Uh, well, what was interesting about this in, about this particular event was that it obviously had quite a large effect on the United States, on the country which attempted that, but not so large effect on the main uh, supposed recipient of the problems, the UK, which hardly noticed that anything was actually going on. So again, we will try to check whether this might be the case in our interaction with China. So, yes. Uh, what is different now that we are again returning to that? Maybe we are, we are just forgetful, perhaps. That happens quite often that every few years, politicians, diplomats, social scientists return to the same topic and they forget what has been published about. Or maybe it's just because there is more asymmetric situation because China has become so huge or because it plays so high a role in our trade. For both the EU and the United States, if you look at merchandise trade, China represents about one fifth of uh, external export, external imports, and about one tenth of external imports. Or is it because of the high degree of openness of economies? Not so much likely. If you look at the external openness of the United States and of the EU, it's actually relatively small compared to individual small countries. So the true, true reason is something else, something that economists have been uh, increasingly trying to study during the past 20 or 25 years. And that's the unprecedented high degree of interconnectedness that has developed here since say mid 1980s or 1990s. Uh, specifically the fact that we are no longer trading fine, finalized products as we used to trade long time ago in the 19th or early 20th century, when there was trade, it was typically a finished commodity produced somewhere and sent somewhere. The reason for that was very simple, coordination at distance, coordination of the supply of parts was quite complicated without our modern telecommunications. These days we are trading activities, we are trading parts. So if you simply stand at the entrance to Skoda in Nadabal and stuff and you're observing the trucks or trains come in there, you'll notice that they are trying to get the right input at the right time. And the input is coming from Poland, uh, Austria, Slovakia, many other countries. So this led to what we call supply chain fragmentation. We have seen lots of demonstrations of that. I don't want to remind you that funny uh, situation called COVID any longer or funny, but if I, when I was walking now, I just remembered how we were um, crazy about COVID and now everybody seems to have forgotten about this kind of, uh, this kind of lesson. But we can look at uh, even more interesting situation which happened not so long time ago when one ship's captain kind of overslept or had some other problem and managed to block temporarily the Suez cable. And suddenly the fact that European companies were not, were not able to get access to inputs, commodities, Euro European customers sometimes to finalize goods from, uh, from the Far East has tremendous effect, mainly in the form of uncertainty about the future. The actual delay wasn't that much longer, that was only about two weeks. But immediately everybody started discussing what might happen with European economies. Will it further deepen the recessions which many were expecting in Europe. So we can move on over this. We don't have to touch on that about the roles in current data. Let me look at something else. So these are data which are trying to evaluate. These are slightly over in a second. I will then show you the ones. So trying to evaluate how much of our trade is purely domestic production. That's the line up there that's slightly orange or orangish, orangish color called pure domestic production. You can see that at least still the financial crisis it was decreasing fairly steeply. And what was growing was actually trade, which depended on a significant degree of cross-border cooperation. That means all the types of trade when Czech producers would be using inputs from other countries and they would export to other countries. Uh, goods which would be based both on domestically produced parts and foreign produced parts. How it worked at that time, for instance, if you look at the Czech electronic sector, 
we were actually successfully exporting to Western Europe, but significant proportion of what we were exporting were actually Chinese inputs assembled in the Czech Republic. If you, did very, if you did some very simple back of the envelope calculations, you found out that out of every billion of Czech crowns of exports of electronics, maybe about 860 million virtually imported Chinese parts, which were complemented with a tiny veneer of Czech labor and Czech inputs and exported as a Czech product abroad. It has got quite a few implications. One of them is that the traditional trade statistics and traditional data about bilateral trade imbalances actually are not useful any longer. So whenever you will be in future working as analysts, if, it's obviously very easy these days to get data about patterns of countries with respect to merchandise trade and service trade. But in spite of the fact it's so, use, uh, it's so easy, it's almost useless. So we must look at different types of indicators. Second issue can be seen on the other uh, chart. The, even though we are calling uh, we are talking about supply chain or global value chains. It's only very rarely a chain. In many cases, these are much more complex pattern, actually networks. And this is what happens when we look at that from a macro perspective, uh, just for some of the products. And we are looking at what happens out of these patterns among countries. In fact, countries start forming a network. And we need to analyze the relative importance of the countries uh, from the point of view of the network. Just like when you are looking, for instance, at uh, evaluation of performance of a football team. Football team is not simply the sum of people in the team. Simply looking at individual characteristics of people in the team, you are not so well able to predict its future performance. What you need to know also are the relationship between them, ability to cooperate. And only then you can evaluate how the team will function. That's exactly the type of, pro type of problem that we were missing with traditional data that we are so often focusing on these days. So uh, that would be the interconnectedness. We can move on to the next part. And then, oops, sorry, if you can return briefly. Uh, what I will be talking about will be mainly trade and economic relations. But besides trade, there are lots of other issues. So international payment networks, international communication networks, transportation networks, science networks, uh, collaboration on research papers, cultural networks. And there is additional problem besides what I will be mentioning here in terms of vulnerability of production, there are quite a few additional troubles that people started discussing, but it's a discussion more, more for people from the PSSI and less for economists. It's about security issues and governance issues in general. If you can, if you can now move to that picture. But there is something that we can call panopticon effect. Panopticon, that would be the traditional organization of prisons where there is a very conveniently located central place from which you can see all the parts of the prison easily and nothing escapes your attention. So if there is a network centered on China or maybe for that matter on the United States, if you are using for communication or for sending our payments, actually we have someone in that network has got an additional extreme advantage. Whether they say it or not, they might be able to monitor at least indirectly our communication. They, they are getting additional very interesting insight. So that's an extra layer that I will so far be avoiding, but some of the methods I will be mentioning can be actually also used to discuss this kind of interaction. So what we can do if you can, if you want to analyze this data, and now I perhaps apologize for I will try to avoid that being too dry and maybe focusing too much on methodologies and facts. But if you are searching for the right type of data, firstly, you can start with something that I have here only. This is not even visible very indirectly. So OECD and Eurostat data, but not the traditional data about trade. You need data about so called input output tables. That's something, and I will briefly switch to the other slide, to the next slide which looks like this. So data which are in a form of huge matrix, where on the left-hand side, you have got multiple countries, let's say 50 countries for each of them, all the industries. On top, you've got all the countries again, and all the industries. And then in the table, there are lots of numbers telling you how much a particular industry, say of the Czech Republic supplies to Austrian agriculture, Chinese electronics production, uh, US uh, beverages, uh, producing sector, and so on and so forth. And only if you have this kind of data, 
You can then try to calculate similar indicators that I was showing before, more global value chains, and you can fully evaluate how really dependent we are on China and maybe China on us. I mean, if you can return back briefly, it's uh, almost the, the only relevant such source available to you and to me. If you don't have that much money to fund some additional research, in the past, additional sources were used by scholars and researchers, sometimes resources based on surprising methodology. So somebody would buy an iPhone, they would tear it down and they would simply track the origin of all the components to find out how the particular supply chain would look like for iPhones. That's doable, but the problem is to get from this very micro level to some macro data. So it's better perhaps to use what is available. These sources are relatively new. You're actually lucky that just last year, the EU started publishing the Figaro data and OECD published a substantial update to this kind of data. So lots of new research is just being generated. The disadvantage, they are obviously as good as what you enter into them. And as somebody in the US said a long time ago, if you look at laws and sausages, you don't want to know what is in them. And the same is true, by the way, about statistics. So, for some of the countries, obviously, the data may not be that reliable, and there is very little we can do about that. Now, what to do with the data? So again, if you'll be trying to learn how to process the data, matching the tables with these inputs and outputs is input-output methodology. So this is what's being done when we are trying to calculate how much of, say, Chinese value that is actually hidden in the exports of Czech products uh, intended for German markets. Then. Maybe I will get across or I will return to CGE modeling, modeling later. And the second very interesting approach is network analysis. It's a very fashionable field of not just economics, but also of social science analysis, but also of historical analysis. It's used also in other parts of uh, social sciences these days, where you collect data about interacting units. And from the data, you are trying to find out how influential they are. We're actually indirectly using that every day without knowing it. If you look at how Google is trying to find out which webs are important for a particular topic that you are searching, actually there is a page ranked statistics that Google is using, which is looking at exactly this, how web pages are linked to each other, which of them are more or less influential. And this is what we can, can try to do with countries within an network. And then what is very interesting, just last year, there was a very interesting progress in this type of research in the last two years. So now we are trying to combine these methods. So we are trying not only to find out what is the proportion, say, of inputs from China in a European exports or vice versa, but we are also trying to find out how relatively important these countries are in the network. And we are also trying to find out, uh, based on that, what is the sensitivity just due to this exposure, it will become perhaps clearer in a second. Ask you. So, so with that, the next one, yeah, even next time. We can. So let's skip this. We can return to that later. So just some calculations of how mutually important we are. Again, please skip this. So this is then the type of statistics I was referring to. So using this kind of newer methods, newer data, we can find out, for instance, what is the relative exposure, not in terms of proportion, but also in terms of the relative frequency of contacts. So these authors, Inamata and Hanaka, they actually calculated. So if there is a supply chain, which starts perhaps in a, uh, at Taiwan or in Korea and ends up in the Japanese automotive sector, so how many times this is actually touching something which is related directly to intra-Chinese trade within Chinese electronic sector. So how much that would be dependent on perhaps new regulations or uh, new interventions of Chinese government into electronic sector. You can see that obviously in many cases, this is zero because it's, it's intra-Chinese issues. Uh, but when you look at the United States, and to some extent, when you look at Germany, there are also some of the more powerful banks telling us that the attempt to use in Germany inputs from Korean ICT sector are actually indirectly interacting with Chinese electronic sector. And it's even more interesting than to look at the next slide, which is comparing. Yes, yeah, the next slide, if I can ask. 
yeah, which is comparing on the horizontal axis the share of value added per sector. Here are the numbers of the sectors and environment countries. So this is here. There are no. Uh, I don't have the data for the EU as a whole, but just for select European countries and for and for United States and other important actors. And on the horizontal axis, there is a share of value added source from China. And the vertical axis, there is the path through frequency. So uh, if I simplify that a bit, how many times, or what is the relative frequency that the particle sector depends during uh, the process of production of its final output on something related to China? You can see that the two uh, numbers are roughly correlated. If I try simple correlations, there is upward sloping line between them. But there are some exceptions. So if I look at the uh, United States and that's US electronic sector from future electronic computer products, it's up there uh, in the left hand side corner of the chart. Uh, the share of value added source from China can be relatively small. So if you look at a typical iPhone or any other similar product, uh, it seems to be imported from China, according to official statistics, but in fact, much of what the Chinese are assembling are imported inputs from Korea, Japan, Thailand, and other countries. But the fact that these inputs are imported to China, while it reduces the proportion of value added that China is contributing to that product, does not mean that China would not have, in some extreme situations, the chance to interact with this production. And that's actually something which can be happening. So if I'm importing inputs, for instance, to Lithuania from China, uh, then obviously China can interact with that, even if the value of these inputs is small, if they are difficult to replace, for instance, if there is some special made component produced for particle electronic products, then if they decide to intervene, that tiny component can stop the whole product from being finished. Something that we have seen but not because of the role of China, in the, in the car sector, in the automotive sector of many European countries, where the fact that we are not able to get, in some cases, effectively uh, simple components, simple chips that would be needed to, to finalize the whole car meant that when you were traveling through the Czech Republic, you were seeing uh, full uh, parking lots, especially near Mladá Boleslav, where there were many cars waiting to be finished, waiting for the final chip. That, that was missing in the assembly. So uh, what happens if uh, some country, for instance, China, tries to interrupt the network somewhere? Or what happens if they start imposing embargoes on some, um, somebody in these networks? Well, obviously there will be short-term effects. Trade flows will be reduced, something that we are currently seeing also in the trade, not just China, but between Europe and Russia. But very soon, we will try to build some ways how to get around this obstacle. So uh, for Lithuania, obviously, there were attempts to move the goods through other countries. For Norway before, there were attempts, for instance, to find uh, some ways how to redeclare Norwegian products as non-Norwegian products and get them into the Chinese market. These days, you might have heard a lot about parallel imports to Russia. Uh, after 2004, 2014, Belarus became a very important exporter of seafood products, in spite of not having any sea, to Russia, simply because these were redeclared European and other products which otherwise would not be allowed to enter the Russian market. So in fact, what is typically happening is that mostly we are not experiencing a complete interruption of the flows. Rather, we are seeing changes in prices. That's one effect. So typically, you need to pay much more because you are paying all the extra margins of all the smugglers and mafias being participating, uh, who part which participate in the process of getting the goods across that newly created border. And for exporters, this means lower price because obviously there will be some elasticity with which you divide the extra margin for all the new guys in the middle between the consumer and the exporter. How much the exporter pays and how much extra uh, will be, uh, how higher will be the cost of the, of the consumer on the final side? Well, that depends on their relative market power. So if the exporter is selling something which is really extra, for which there is no replacement, these days those could be perhaps chips being sent to Russia. I bet that the few chips that Russia is trying to get via China, they're actually getting very, very expensively. And the sellers of these chips 
now obviously because those new additional new uh, barriers to China are not losing pretty much any money at all. And it's the consumer is paying because the elasticity of ability to replace the chips is very small. The second issue besides crisis, which is really happening, is uncertainty. So we are not sure whether we will be able to get the supply in time. And that's a problem not so much for farmer users. If I am buying a new car or a new IKEA wardrobe, well, if I wait a minute, a, a day or two for the delivery or a week, well, no big deal in most of the cases, unless it's a kind of birthday present or anything similar. But if I'm trying to produce something and there are lots of employees working and I'm paying their wages, or if, if my warehouse is getting full of other inputs which are waiting to be assembled and because of this I cannot receive additional inputs, that's a problem. So this kind of uncertainty then leads to the fact that countries are becoming less involved in similar global value chains. They are trying to be more cautious or businessmen in these countries and they are trying to uh, play more safely, they are trying to keep bigger slacks, they are trying to be less dependent on such countries. This is the actual danger that the Chinese understood very well when issuing the threats to countries like Lithuania, because they realized that they can try to discourage uh, foreign companies from participating in Lithuanian manufacturing, and this would reduce Lithuanian access to global value chains. And unfortunately, or fortunately, from other research, for which we don't have that much time, we know very well for, that for many less developed countries, uh, the access to global value chains, it's a very interesting way how to get richer. It's a kind of elevator which allows you to uh, get over domestic troubles and which significantly contributes to your country growth. What else? So linked to that will be the long-run effect. So in the long run, countries which where such interruptions can be happening frequently, they are likely to be influenced by relocation of industry. They will not be connected so closely to global value chains. They will be growing more slowly. Presumably, innovative activities in such countries can be reduced. And here is our problem. We can relatively well predict from the data I was showing to you the first part. So the direct effects on welfare of interruption of, uh, of these value chains or of imposition of embargoes. After all, among the more advanced texts, there was a text which was providing a summary of research on the effects of trade war between the US and China. Um, but the second part, uncertainty, that's something that we are typically getting wrong. So uh, after 2016, when we were trying to predict the effects of Brexit, we actually overestimated the effects of uncertainty and chaos in Britain, and some of the early estimates of the losses of Britain were a bit too high. This year, uh, some of us, including myself, when we were predicting what will happen because of the disruption of trade with Russia, normally it should be a non-issue. Even the imports of uh, gas and oil are actually not that dramatic to some extent. But there was a problem. We come, kind of underestimated when making the forecast a whole big chaos and speculative efforts in the market will follow after these interruptions. So uncertainty is difficult to evaluate. Uh, and then what is even more difficult to evaluate are the, all these long run cumulative effects. So there we are pretty much in the way. So therefore, when we estimate the first part of effects, and if, as you will see, they don't have to be that threatening, it still doesn't mean that we can afford to interrupt these relations too easily. So how high can be the costs? Again, I will uh, start with history because in most cases, uh, you are not allowed as an economist to try to interrupt your country's trade with other countries completely. Or if you're allowed to do that, it's in a strange country like the DPRK and you don't get the correct data or uh, the country is still functioning strangely because of some of many other influences. So actually till today, and that's the reason why I had it on one of the first slides, we are sometimes using evidence from the United States, either from the post-1929 uh, smooth holy tariff or from the early 19th century attempt to isolate the US economy almost completely. What is interesting, uh, in the light of what you have all heard about the importance of globalization and openness, the best estimate that we have so far seems that uh, the effects, while being quite, quite visible in terms of prices, 
And while they were felt very sensitively by US population in many places, especially in coastal regions, only amounts to about 5% of GDP. So that's about how much we lost during the time of times of COVID, that's about how much many countries in Western Europe lost approximately during the last financial crisis. It's significantly less than what we suffered uh, when we had the transformation recessions of early 1990s. At that time, the Czech Republic lost about 15% of its GDP. Countries like Ukraine, growth transition lost maybe up to 50 or 60% of their GDP. It doesn't have to uh, look that bad. Another type of experiment of this type that we have are uh, effects of the US-China trade war. Now, this wasn't complete, far from that, actually. It was still quite busy trading relationship between the two countries. In fact, even members of the president's family were still participating in business between the West and China in spite of the embargoes being imposed on the other side. So if I remember correctly, the United States imposed tariffs on approximately 350 million worth of imports, China about 100. And as a result, when you try to estimate the effects, the direct effects, they appear to be small. Uh, on the US side, maybe something like 0.04% of GDP. That's actually so small that we can't even measure GDP with, with this level of precision. On the Chinese side, slightly bigger, but still about 0.3%. Again, given the number of problems that you are facing when trying to evaluate Chinese GDP, I would say that's at the margin of our ability to measure the, the effect at all. Uh, Itakura later tried a dynamic CG model. That's a model which is trying to add additional cumulative issues. So what happens when savings are influenced, etc. They got bigger results, but still about perhaps with all the cumulative effects, 1.4% and one point three or 35 percent for the US. So it doesn't look that bad. And that's part of the problem. If I go back again to the country in the East, uh, the evaluation in the minds and brains of decision makers of the future risks of a possible intervention is extremely important. Had Mr. Putin known about the true cost of invasion to Ukraine, maybe it would not have happened or it would have been non different. If there are no people who would be assuming that these costs are relatively low, like that, and obviously on the US side, in the US, as well as in China, there are lots of very good researchers publishing papers in input output economic law from China. If we know about this, we may be tempted. So maybe we can try to inter interrupt this in get less vulnerable once and forever and avoid the problems. Unfortunately, there are still those dynamic effects. So, can we go to the next slide? So, how high are the costs? So, uh, the direct costs are low. By the way, on the next two slides, and they have some uh, my simulation, but these are very basic. So, maybe we can get to them later. Uh, but there are issues that we cannot do that clearly. So, effects of uncertainty which also you would have to add in some strange additional way, like assuming that countries will be getting more skeptical about investment uh, or complex and wake in our threats of the Sino-Lithuanian type, Lithuanian type. Actually, for the past few months, I've been trying to design a few methods how to evaluate such threats, and it's troublesome. We know that the Chinese were threatening German companies. If uh, Lithuania continues, having talks with Taiwan, German companies in Lithuania will be having troubles, and then they will be having troubles when trying to export to China. Mm -hmm. But what if we would be trying to apply the same threat maybe on the Czech Republic? Which country will China choose? Maybe Germany again, because of their, let's say, relative vulnerability, vulnerability to similar threats. But which sector? Would, it, would that be car sector? or something else, and you're getting a number of scenarios that you can try to analyze. And it's pretty difficult to arrive at some particular number that you could sub, that you could cite as the effect of such a scenario. And then the big issue at the end that we were again struggling with when doing similar analysis for the relations between EU and Russia, how about elasticity? Elasticity means the flexibility with which we can replace, for instance, inputs from China and with which they can replace inputs from Europe. 
Uh, if you look at OECD classification, something that we don't have, or some OECD reports and WTO reports, typically they will be talking about maybe five or six types of relationships within these value chains. So of which some of them are very basic. So similar to the situation of you that you are facing when a, a nearby store where you, where you were doing much of your shopping shuts down. Well, typically it's not a problem to find some replacement. You'll simply walk extra 50 meters, there will be another supermarket. You can replace it very easily, the losses can be small. And readjustment will be quick. But what if there's something much more unique, which is difficult to replace, either because of how it is designed, or maybe because, in the case of gas between Russia and EU, or Russia or China, because there are some, there is some infrastructure, the pipelines, which are connecting just some of the resources to the final market. And it's difficult to re switch them to other possible users. The problem is that typically when we are using historical data, we have got some information about how easy these replacements are. But these are mostly based on smaller shots. If there is now a big shot, like losing all the uh, Russian gas or offering lots of extra Russian gas to China, will the sensitivity to such a shot be the same? Or presumably, as we can only speculate, much bigger than in the case of the smaller shots. So take what I have here with a great deal of caution. So maybe I should not even cite that. The next slide. So if I simply try to put into a fairly complex CGE model, but still relatively simple in terms of the methodology as it is used today, some assumptions. So this is a model where I tried to put some uh, eight regions, one of them are the United States and the rest of the uh, North America, uh, China, the rest of Asia, U27, uh, the rest of the world. And then I was trying to model what would happen if I completely intersect uh, or completely interrupt trade relations, in this case, from the US to China and from China to the US. How would the economy be adjust? So it's the first type of the effect. No uncertainty, no problem. Again, we are having here the problem uh, that I showed before. So the effect appeared appear to be rather small. The only large number here that you can see is in the last line. And that's because these are equivalent variations. It tells you about what would be the total losses of equivalent income of US or Chinese consumers respectively. But it's a total number. So all the 330 million US citizens and all the, let's say 1.3 or 1.4 billion Chinese citizens. So it's uh, then quite well in line with what you can see here, the effects on the real GDP. I was often skeptical whether this can be correct, but when you look at the results by Itakura or some, something cited in the other papers, it probably can be true. Then you look at the EU and China, <coughs> The same story. In fact, in both cases, you can see that China should be the more vulnerable country, just in, in the case of pure interruption of mutual trade. Obviously, it doesn't feel to be the more vulnerable. Part of it can be a bit exaggerated, a hubris-like evaluation of current situation. After all, you might have noticed that Xi Jinping has become very ambitious and very self-confident in his evaluation of both his internal position and of external power of China. Part of it can be the realization that maybe our countries are more sensitive. Uh, in, in the case of both the US and uh, EU, because of our political system and because of our, of our media, if, if you have been browsing through Chinese media recently, you will notice there are lots of reports about uh, problems that you're having because of Russia and lots of problems with crime and other troubles in the United States, decaying infrastructure and so on. And obviously, it's very easy for them to show these problems here. It's very easy for them to block news about similar negative phenomena in China. In our media, it's not possible. In our media, we are getting sometimes exaggerated, sometimes a bit uh, chaotic and uh, uh, enhanced picture of what kind of state or what kind of dangers we are living in. So that's one issue. Second issue, especially in the case of the EU, the fact that we are divided. So uh, China tried it in the case of the United States too. If you look at the design of their response to the trade war, you will notice that they focused on products which particularly strongly selected regions in the United States 
And you could actually see quite interesting correlation with the mapping of preferences of the candidates and parties for the next elections. In the case of the EU, it's even easier. I can easily design a policy which will actually cause lots of troubles, let's say, to small countries in Eastern Europe and less troubles to Western European countries. And then logically, China would be able to assume, well, even though we can be more sensitive in general, we can easily divide the EU. And after using this divisive policy, the EU will be incapacitated and they, never, they will never respond in time to our threat. And they will actually give up. We'll be able to make with them some reasonable deal. Yeah. <clears throat> so can we do without China? And if we go to the extreme, without participation in global value chains? Well, the numbers show that at least in the short and medium run, perhaps yes. After all, we can see in the case of Russia that, uh, well, with uh, hefty help of, uh, with rather large help of local propaganda and with <coughs> significant simplification of products, dumping down of production, et cetera, quite, quite a lot of adaptation is possible. You'll be simply having less advanced less developed, more expensive products will be more slightly poorer, but it doesn't have to have look necessarily that dramatic. But the problem is that there are some other effects. So firstly, the long run effects I mentioned before, you'll be all growing much more slowly than before. You'll be all uh, struggling with uh, less ambitious, innovative and investment effort by companies. Uh, then what else? If you really try to protect ourselves by detaching from China completely, well, on the one hand, we will be protected much more against future attempts at blackmailing. On the other hand, well, you, we can actually contribute to the threat. There is something that we call in economics self-fulfilling prophecies. So the more we are discussing decoupling, decoupling and similar interventions, obviously the easier it is on the other side to introduce similar measures and explain that it's not because they will be trying to hit us, simply because of their response to our policies. If you, if you want to read some very nice representation of this, I would really call it hypocrisy, uh, even though now perhaps viewers from China uh, who are definitely listening on Zoom a little bit, um, might protest. Uh, there is a speech that uh, Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs Wang Yi had in September, I think it was in New York, it was about the right China for the right way for China in the United States. You can see the printout or the text of the speech on the website of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that's a beautiful speech about how peaceful China is, how it has never attacked or blackmailed other country, and how they are facing unfair tendencies of the United States to encircle China, etc. Uh, it's a very nice example of how you can use uh, facts uh, in an interesting way, how you can avoid discussing the problem between China and India, uh, lots of other internal issues, including um, specific positions for Taiwan, on Taiwan or Uyghurs. But what is very important, we're also suggesting that if they are closing down, if they are thinking about becoming more self-dependent, if they are introducing defense instruments, it's not because they would like to, but because they are pushed to that by the West. So we are actually providing them also with additional pretense. Now they would be probably doing that even without this pretense, but at least the explanation of that would be slightly worse. But what is even more troublesome? Well, and that's something that might have been visible if you look at the design of the trade deal between US and China. Uh, adopted during Trump's presidency. To some extent, we might be moving in a similar direction. For instance, this trade deal uh, introduced direct targets, how much extra soybeans China should be importing from the US. So it was a bit going in the direction of uh, not so much providing opportunities for new, for new private business in China, maybe kind of undermining the power of the party from the inside, but pretty much accepting the logic, well, there is the state that should be controlling what the companies are doing. Uh, the second issue linked to that is that the more we are trying to uh, intervene, for instance, in the form of the current, currently introduced ban on employment of uh, US trade nationals in China, if not implemented in a course, in a acceptable way, if not accompanied by additional assistance to such people, obviously there is a danger. We may sometimes 
antagonize such people. We can actually look like somebody who's moving in the wrong direction. And frankly, I'm not quite sure whether we should not try to rather uh, move in a, or remain on the trajectory that originally made the United States and largely also European culture so attractive to many individuals around the whole world. That means that relative flexibility, relative freedom, rather than introducing strict bureaucratic measures. After all, even though the coordinating committee restrictions imposed after 1949 probably had some negative effects on the ability of the USSR to get advanced technologies from the United States. In fact, when after 1989, US archives, sorry, uh, uh, Soviet archives were opened, we found out that they had access to pretty much almost every recent US invention. The actual problem wasn't that much in getting access to the knowledge. The problem was that their uh, aiding economy wasn't uh, incentivized enough and wasn't uh, ready enough to start producing such commodities. And that's actually something that we should try to think about. China assumes that it's now on the growth phase and that it will be soon, if I borrow the words of Nikita Khrushchev from 1960s, bury the West and bury the United States. It's pretty apparent that, especially Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping sees uh, the rejuvenation of China as something inevitable, as a kind of maybe mater materialistic Marxist fact, some additional stage in history where China will become strong and will rule the world. Many economists have got a lot of doubt about that. If uh, we uh, discuss how the Chinese model well, uh, looks like, while China can be successful in stabilizing internally uh, the power of the party, is doing that at a significant extent of cost. I know that perhaps in other lectures, you might have had some discussions about the relative merits of Chinese model or the benefits of uh, Chinese economic policies. But in fact, economists are far from sure that there is something special about Chinese model. Even selected Chinese economists working in the, in the West has, uh, when doing independent analysis, well, they came to conclusion that China was growing more strongly when it was liberalized. Whenever it is decentralizing, whenever it is introducing additional constraints, like what you have seen recently, uh, the additional uh, rules concerning uh, regulation of internet companies. So there was some liberalization for foreign investors, but more or less uh, private businesses were have been uh, more and more regulated in China. All this is reducing the ability of China to grow in future. Besides contributing to the lower dynamics, it will be also meaning lower investments and innovation dynamics, especially innovation dynamics and efficiency issues. So I'll be far from saying that the situation with China will be trouble-free, uh, walk through some rose garden in future. Definitely not. We are on a collision path in many respects, whether it's the EU or the United States. But to try to think about what was making us strong and what was making the Chinese model or the Soviet model weaker, and typical for us, it was the fact that we had deregulated markets. We had quite a lot of incentives which were allowing people like you to fully use their talents. These regulated countries with what we call the state capitalism model are like that. So I'm not against a kind of um, decoupling that means uh, revising again something like the coordination committee, having temporary export bans on really sensitive uh, technologies, at least as a signal that we are doing something. But typically, it doesn't play the role that it's designed to play. After all, even with the current embargo on Russia, you can still find many Western products in Russian markets. And these are far from important products. These can be, let's say, Western perfumes, Western bags, et cetera. And the same will be happening with strict controls on China's super oil. But if we try to overdo this kind of regulation, we may be losing our initial advantage. So we can move on to the end. So, the conclusions. We should perhaps remember what made the West great. And I would be a bit op optimistic here. I think that still uh, the relative freedom, the ability to pursue our 
lies as we warp and not as some regulator tell us to do, that's actually one of the most important issues that we should try to preserve. And the coupling interventions by the state, the state of the issue should try to monitor the vulnerabilities. It should try to address the biggest issues like uh, preventing that important Western European companies end up in Chinese hands, where obviously the know-how can be very easy to transfer to China. So investment screening can be fine. But introducing some dramatic measures that would be uh, reducing the exports administratively, that can be a little bit over the top. So first of all, what we need, we will need to continue with the research and with getting decent data on these vulnerabilities. And especially, which might be your case, we need to actually address the medium and long run effects of similar distortions. The short run effects look to be, to some of, some of us may be disappointingly small. Uh, secondly, while introducing the barriers, we actually need to make sure that not that we are not facing some negative welfare loss, but these will be always present and it's a relatively small price to pay for avoiding some more significant conflict. But we need to make sure that we are not uh, reducing the basic or we are not degrading the basic standards and basic logic of our economic power. And well, that will be about all that I prepared, maybe a bit too general at the end. So thank you for your attention. I hope that I haven't put anybody to sleep yet. Yeah. And so uh, if you know, if yes, then I apologize. And I think we can have questions here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to challenge you a bit on uh, drug substitutory purposes and uh, the analytical component. As for my background, I'm a defense policy analyst. From my point of view, and even analyzing Chinese uh, strategic uh, uh, documents and Chinese defense policy, the conflict has always been there. The China from the 1980 they personally published their uh, defense doctrine is set to destroy the West. They have said, said it openly. They're using the economics, which is also in uh, their open, and they're saying, saying this to us openly. They want to destroy us. And they're using the economics and the interconnectedness of our economies as one of the many, I have many weapons from the Arsenal and many weapons from the Arsenal. Also, if we look at the, the One Belt One Road Initiative, what uh, is the main purpose of the One Belt One Road is not the interconnectedness of the trade, it's the subjugation of uh, the territories on which this trade is conducted. We have seen it in Central Asia, we are seeing it in Africa. So, about uh, the inevitability of conflict in case of our regulation, the conflict is not inevitable because we are discussing in public. The conflict is inevitable, and we are in the conflict right now because the China chose so, and it chose a long time ago. Okay, I will start with a few remarks first. About the Berlin Road, definitely, I'm aware of the fact that it's only introduced for the sake of trade. But actually, there are multiple levels of Berlin Road. One of them very nicely demonstrates the troubles of domestic Chinese economic policies and the actual weakness. If you look at the discussions in China about Berlin Road, I was surprised so when, I, uh, when I was discussing this with some Chinese researchers, and they were strongly proposing in some cases that one of the ways why it was also implemented was the fact that they were having these huge problems with overcapacity. It was something that was obviously designed to meet some different objectives. One, if I have, because of inefficient government regulation, excess capacities in my steel sector, cement production, and other construction and materials production, then let's give money to nearby countries. Let's try to make sure that they are using our capacities. And by this, we can slightly improve the use of the capacity. Second issue is actually linked to some of the analysis that's done with the use of network theory. Obviously, they were investing into some strategic places like Djibouti, et cetera, in a way which helps them control some choke points on international trade routes or also on uh, transportation uh, routes, which can be routes which can be relevant for military uses in the future. And concerning the subjugation, that's a tricky issue. Again, from the Let's say game theoretical perspective, in the case of the short run point of view, they kind of succeeded uh, with this kind of, well, 
carrot-like willingness to offer cheap loans and easy to abuse contracts to African governments, well, not only African governments, we have seen similar situations in the Balkans, where obviously with the use of uh, Chinese money was always that was left in the pockets of the participating Chinese companies, something that which, which was left in the pockets of local rulers. In some cases, the projects are perhaps mainly done because of this. And then in some cases, some infrastructure was built and who paid for that? Uh, well, those are the future generations of the people in a Mozambique, Kenya, Sri Lanka, etc., for who are now owing all those extra money to China. So in my opinion, it's a multifaceted part. Uh, You're right that, uh, um, let's say, uh, the attempt to provide additional infrastructure for control around the world was definitely one of the influences. About the first part, well, I was simplifying it here a little bit. Definitely, I would agree that at least some parts of Chinese society have been always thinking about control. I'm not sure whether all parts of Chinese society and all parts of Chinese leadership uh, that's the issue. Economists are always a bit naive in this. Uh, security and especially intelligence analysts, they are always a little bit more pessimistic. So I've read quite a few. There's actually a very colorful book about the history of Chinese intelligence by Roger Faligo, where he sees pretty much behind every decision, some well thought strategy, etc. I would love the world to function so efficiently, but knowing what I have seen about the efficiency or the inefficiency of very bureaucratic, bureaucratic structures in the Soviet Union and in China and other similar countries like Myanmar, I am extremely skeptical that this, uh, the, the complexity that uh, a design of such strategy would, would require, that it's really implementable. I can be wrong on that, but I think it's rather a mixture of motives. Definitely, if you speak with military people, uh, even uh, if you spoke with them in, say, 1990s, they would see the United States as the arch rival and maybe uh, Japan and Taiwan as some millions who should be, who should be buried. And, uh, but I am not sure really all of them uh, meant it like that. The additional layer, why I would speak about uh, the problem with, with uh, getting some counter response on the other side is linked to the fact that I haven't had much time to open here. But if you look at who is participating in these global value chains on the Chinese side and who's generating the value, it's actually largely the sector of domestic private Chinese companies. Now, obviously, we can have lots of discussions which of them are truly private, which of them are linked to the army and to the state, which of them some are somehow trying to play both sides, presumably majority would be in the second and third category somehow. But uh, if uh, we look at the position of the current leadership in the party, they definitely dislike even these private companies and they want to have everything under common rule. I think that from our perspective, uh, having a bit more privately organized Chinese economy it doesn't have to be that bad. That's still a chance, or it still generates a chance that there will be some independent thinking, some independent wealth something that from the point of view of the long run development of Chinese society might contribute to at least the very distant chances at some future liberalization. Now, it's obviously very naive. It's probably never happened in this way before. We are hoping a lot in the past, in 1990s, that China, thanks to growing middle class, would become more liberal, etc. And it has not happened. But on the other hand, uh, all the authoritarian, whether, the, whether that was in the Soviet Union or in China, typically hated in even this mixed or even a more independent private sector. And probably there is a reason why they are hating that. And actually helping them cause troubles exactly to this type of sector, I'm not sure it's exactly what we want. Yep. Um, it's very current. The decision was this morning. The German Chancellor of the German Capital made the decision that the Chinese state run company uh, is allowed to have a share of a uh, port, um, a share in mm -hmm. Germany's biggest port, Hamburg. Um, the original share was 33%, now it's 24.9%, so a minority, so non controlling, non -controlling <laughs> state. But in, in your opinion, is that a a measure of what you had in your concluding slide is that a measure of engagement with, with Chinese companies, or is it still naive because it is critical infrastructure and this should be this should not be given to the hands of Chinese state control companies? 
program. I'm afraid I don't have enough information to evaluate whether Hamburg is still critical, let's say, for German economy. There are lots of other alternative ports in Europe, like Rotterdam or I think even Genoa to some extent, which can play a significant role. So, but I was also surprised by that. It's a, it's a strange signal that we are giving. Uh, and again, well, at least to some actors, it can give the signal that uh, Germany is still somewhere in the middle, not fully resolved to change the side. These are still people hoping in, in, in that something like that. How uh, was that? When they do handel, that that will happen. That means change through trading, or that there are still people who may be in a Chinese pocket. How like just like there were people, for instance, in energy sector who were previously in, in the Russian pocket. So um, having some common EU policy on that and then having a decision at EU level that's seen from the perspective of European networks, we really don't need Hamburg for that much and therefore do what we want with that, sell it to the Martians. That would actually make me much, much uh, uh, more relaxed in, in this case. So uh, on the other hand, so still getting access to the, to the asset, it's questionable what they will be able to do with that. Uh, when you look at the shopping spree that Chinese had a few years ago in China, it was obviously motivated by multiple purposes. There were some state companies or state-related companies trying to get access to interesting know-how in Western Europe. But then there were also private owners or semi-private companies or politically linked individuals who simply had access or preferential access to liquidity from Chinese markets and which were buying, willing to buy anything uh, while the excess lasted without any strategy, without any logic. So brewery here, winery in France, etc. Often uh, the assets were not used in some strategic or logical way. Even I have heard that some of the wineries actually felt into disrepair and uh, some of them actually lost their original attractiveness and you know, the quality of wine. So uh, that's the issue that there can be uh, two scenarios. One is that it was simply available, and so someone in China decided to buy that without any larger strategy. And it's kind of harmless. And all that can happen is that a few years later, we'll be actually bailing somebody out or repairing something in, in the harbor. Alternative number two, that there is really some well thought out strategy. But I don't know that for that, we would have to ask somebody with access to much more classified materials. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about Taiwan. Uh, we have a new, like, old new leadership that uh, seems to be more involved to bring Taiwan back home. Um, can you use your methodology or maybe like is somebody trying to model what would be the economic effects of such invasion in Taiwan? I guess the invasion is such uh, that's very difficult to model from an economist perspective. After all, we, we have got some data from Ukraine, but I, I don't know whether it's transferable to the case of Taiwan. You definitely see isolation, that's something that is estimated to be the first move. So isolating Taiwan from transportation rules, uh, Taiwan would not be able to act as a supplier to the West any longer. Definitely, it would be troublesome to bring component and intermediate parts to Taiwan. China can do that without occupying the territory simply by using uh, using anti-aircraft defense uh, and using the air power that they have. At least, it cause significant complications in these relations. What will come next? Uh, I wouldn't wouldn't dare to estimate. Estimating the development of wartime economies, that's, that's a bit troublesome. Um, even if you look at the data about, let's say, Second World War and it effects on uh, the Czech lands or on Germany, sometimes the results can be very surprising. There are lots of unexpected, unintended consequences. For instance, when the Allied uh, forces tried to bomb German cities, actually, in some cases, the uh, volume of labor available to German defense factories was increasing rather than decreasing, as we would expect. So I definitely wouldn't like to speculate here. We can speculate what would happen to the rest of the world if you lose Taiwan completely. Actually, one of the methodologies I was uh, mentioning here, it would help. There is a, a bit uh, cynical or 
a very specific method, which we call uh, hypothetical extraction, which was designed for originally by Japanese researchers who are analyzing what might happen if, uh, let's say, one uh, prefecture or one area in Japan is completely devastated by an earthquake, how that will influence all the other prefectures which have got a supplier and client relationship with the prefecture. So, because in the OEC data, not so much in the EU data, the EU somehow maybe because of the political correctness doesn't have Taiwan as a separate entity in their important tables. By the way, if you look at trade data, the United Nations country database doesn't have Taiwan either. And when you dig in the setup, you will find out that you must search for Taiwan as other East Asia. So it's sometimes a bit tricky to get the data, but we can in principle evaluate what would happen if you would completely uh, remove Taiwanese economy from global economy that can be calculated. Obviously, the effects on us or on Europe would be very small, which is part of the problem, because the Taiwanese obviously know that if uh, really China starts blackmailing us or the US, that on the one hand, there are some political promises, but on the other hand, with the exception of the dependence on uh, imports of micro components from Taiwan, there's actually not that much, there are not so many real reasons other than uh, some belief in democratic values, why we should help them. And seeing how we, how we, will, how we were able or not able to respond to threats in Yugoslavia or now in Ukraine, obviously that's an issue for Taiwan. For me, what is very interesting here are now the debates about the attempts to motivate Taiwanese companies to produce chips in the US or in selected new markets. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the motivation of the Taiwanese, because on the one hand, obviously, by this, they can hope to get access to some interesting resources or maybe technologies from the West, maybe use of robotic plants. But on the other hand, if I would be in Taiwan, uh, handing over the production of especially the most advanced chips, that's a bit troublesome because then the rest of the world has got some replacement for the possible scenarios when my economy would be devastated. And it can mean, Cynically said the threat that they will be less willing to defend me in the future. So we will see how that turns out. Okay, thank you very much for the perfect wrap up. And we can actually continue the discussion more and more with the last line in our hand. Thank you very much.